Welcome in everybody to the flagship podcast. I am Chip Brown of Horns247.com, joined as always by our managing editor, the one and only Taylor Estes. Taylor, how's your June going? It's uh, going fine. Uh, how's yours, Chip? Well, it's it's just one more day closer to football season, which is flipping fantastic. And we've still got a lot going on with the Longhorns in other sporting news. Uh, we'll just touch on that real quickly before we get back to our, our summer uh, position ranking countdown. Oh yeah, oh yeah, last week. We're counting down from 10 to one. And uh, last week we hit uh, position number 10, shocker, the offensive line and number nine special teams. We'll get to number eight and number seven in just a second here on the flagship podcast. But um, a couple of quick shout outs uh, first to rising senior golfer Travis Vick for finishing as the low amateur at the U.S. Open Championship where uh, fellow Longhorn Scotty Scheffler, the world number one ranked golfer, um, finished runner up one shot behind Matthew Fitzpatrick, who played really gutsy golf down the stretch. But Travis Vick, how about this, folks? He finishes as the low amateur two strokes ahead of an Aggie uh, despite a quadruple bogey nine on the par five eighth hole. Now, if you watch the U.S. Open you saw this hole was easy. It was short, but it had this crazy false front that rolled down like 70 yards. And if you didn't get the ball up on top and away from that false front, you ran into real trouble. Other golfers, you know, it took them three and four times to get it up that hill and keep the ball on the green. Travis Vick hit his second shot over the green, tried to chip it away from the pin to hold it on the green. Couldn't. It rolled all the way off. It took him... Uh, five more shots to get on the green. He two putted for a nine, but still finished low M and he birdied the next two holes after that uh, debacle. So kudos to Travis Vick for getting that done. And then Taylor, um, the director's cup, Texas has clinched a second straight director's cup winning four national championships will help in that effort. Obviously uh, indoor track for the men um, women's, tennis back to back men's golf. We just mentioned Travis Vick. He was the clinching point for men's golf um, and rowing all won national championships this year. So Texas has clinched the director's cup over Stanford. Second and it, yeah. And look, you take your top 19 sports and Stanford has 36 sports. Texas only has 20. So the margin for error because Stanford racks up points in things like fencing and wrestling. Right. Uh, Texas, pretty much every sport uh, has to be counted. But 10 number two finishes for Texas athletics in the 21-22 school year, including men's swimming, women's swimming, men's and women's track. Uh, Taylor, that's pretty impressive stuff. It is. It, it's it's a huge testament to you know, the impact that Chris Del Conte has made since he took over as the athletic director of Texas. I mean, what was it? Stanford had like an, a streak of like 20 plus years, wasn't it? Yeah, 25 year hold on yeah. that director's cup. That's half. I mean, that's a quarter of a century. I mean, that's how many times that they won it in a row. And so for Texas to win it back to back, I mean, I know that t people listening to the podcast are probably thinking like, we want football to come back instead of the other ones. But still, I mean, this a successful athletic department, you would think, especially at a place like Texas, a football, you know, department would start to gain some traction too. So this is, this is huge for um, Texas and kudos to all of the sports, um, all the participants in the sports and to Chris Del Conte for really, you know, just, I mean, think back to Chip when, prior to when he was here, I mean, this athletic part was in shambles, literally in shambles. And for like a decade, it wasn't just maybe not a decade, but it, it was starting, you know, the, the foundation was starting to crack probably within a decade um, prior to um, Crystal Conte taking over as athletic director. So this is the fact that he's been able to do this in a short amount of time is, is just a, a huge testament, I think, to the, the type of guy and the type of athletic director that Texas has. And this is a guy that you want to keep around for a long time. Yeah. I mean, you, you hit on it really the, the leadership at the university of Texas from the president, from the tower 
down was fractured really starting in 2013 when, um, you know, they, there was a group of big money donors who wanted to go after Nick Saban and they needed Mac Brown to resign peacefully. He didn't. Um, Steve Patterson was hired basically to fire Mac Brown. He didn't do that until he was forced to, um, after the football banquet of, uh, 2013. And then, uh, Patterson was a disaster. He was fired 22 months into a, a seven year guaranteed contract. And then Mike Perrin, the former Longhorn football player, Houston attorney comes in on an interim basis. Uh, he hired David Pierce. And he and Greg Fenvis hired Tom Herman. And then Chris Del Conte comes in December of 2017 and has overseen $750 million in facility upgrades, uh, at least $10 million spent on each sport at Texas, and, and also the new Athletic Hall of Fame in the north end of DKR, and great coaching hires uh, like Edric Florial and and Mike White, the softball coach, and Vic Schaefer, who's gone to back-to-back -back elite eights, and and so you know, Chris softball Beard, goes. Too, I think he has a lot of you know coming too. Yeah, yeah, and Chris Beard has been to a Final Four. He'll he'll get it going, mm -hmm. and and so it just it is the the culture of Texas athletics is totally different. And remember, they had to overcome the eyes of Texas and all that, and still the culture at Texas super strong and and headed in the right direction for sure now taylor we mentioned the the standard of excellence and that leads us into our next headline which is texas baseball um, they go to and barbecue in omaha the expectation is always uh for texas baseball to make it to omaha it's a, an incredibly high standard but when you've been to the college world series 38 times and they've only held the event 75 times it tells you that that's the standard and Texas gets there uh, in dramatic fashion with the, the come from behind win over East Carolina in game two to force a game three, they win, but then they get to Omaha and get rolled. Um, Notre Dame beats them seven to three, Texas A&M eliminates them 10 to two. And David Pierce, um, as first reported by D1 baseball, Kendall Rogers, and we have since confirmed David Pierce is parting ways with his longtime assistant and pitching coach, Sean Allen. Um, and, you know, if you follow Texas baseball this year, you know that they were number one in fielding. They set records offensively at the plate and the pitching was all over the place. Um, guys who were standouts last year, like Tristan Stevens, who led the Big 12 in wins last year, and freshman All-American Aaron Nixon, uh, the closer for Texas, really struggled this year. Others who were counted on as relievers, Travis Staley, Andre Duplantier, Coy Cobb, all struggled uh, with their pitching. The ERA uh, surged, even though they still led the Big 12 in ERA. At the end of the season, Taylor, they were not playing their best. Even Pete Hansen and Lucas Gordon, the two best pitchers, two best starting pitchers for Texas all year, uh, struggled in yeah. Omaha. And so, um, Tough decision for David Pierce, but look, if he's in that dugout every day and sees the dynamics and feels like there's some kind of breakdown or disconnect, then he has to make a tough call, and he has. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this is a this is a uh, even tougher call, I think, if, if you don't know the history between David Pierce and Sean Allen. I mean, this is the third stop that Sean Allen has coached on David Pierce's coaching staff, dating back to. Um, Sam Houston State, Tulane, and then Texas. So this is a more than a decade long coaching relationship that that David Pierce had to cut ties with. And I think Chip, when you, you know, I, I saw when Kendall Rogers um, broke this news, and kudos to him for um, getting the scoop on this. But when he broke it, you know, he he seemed pretty shocked in the tweets at least that he has sent for it. And he, he mentioned the Big Twelve, you know, like leading the Big Twelve ERA and everything, and all things considered losing Tanner Witt, but I, where I think that there could be, you know, just kind of reading the tea leaves a little bit, when Tanner Witt went down, everything in the pitching rotation and pitching staff honestly changed. And that's where you're kind of wondering, where's the coaching? There's got to be some sort of leadership here. Just in, and, I, and let me let me say this: I don't want to discredit losing a starter, and especially in college baseball. Like it, that is a huge blow. I think a lot of people underestimate it. 
the problem was that blow really started fracturing the entire uh, bullpen, in my opinion. And so um, you would hope that you had somebody who could really help them snap out of it. It's difficult to say that. I know as somebody who's been around baseball my whole life, especially with pitchers, they're very, very mental individuals. And it's a very mental um, position to play. It's probably one of the more difficult positions in sports to play aside from quarterback. Honestly, I mean, you're, you're out there alone and you know, a lot falls on you. A lot of the blame falls on you. A lot of the credit falls on you. It's kind of a similar, they're the quarterback of college baseball, of baseball in general. And so there is a lot of, um, you know, um, I guess like, I'm trying to think what the right word is. There's a lot that you have to go through a lot of adversity if you're a pitcher, but you also need to have a coach who's going to help you come through that. I mean, these are still amateur athletes, I guess. We're still going to call them that, you know? And so I, I just think that watching the entire, you know, pitching staff at Texas just crumble, it seemed, after that Tanner Witt injury. You wish that I, – I would imagine you would wish if you were David Pierce that Sean Allen would find a way to kind of help them all snap out of it because they weren't – it's not like Texas has scrubs – on the roster, you know, I mean, these are, as you mentioned, these are guys that were successful last season and they just kind of fell off. So, you know, it's a, this has got to be a tough move for David Pierce, but I feel like if he's going to make this move, it was probably a justified one. Yeah. I mean, look, it's tough. Tristan Stevens, as I said, led the big 12 and wins last year, had a chance to go into pro baseball returned because he felt like this team could compete for a national championship after coming one game away from reaching the championship series at the college world series last year. And Tristan Stevens ends up losing his starting uh, rotation spot as the Saturday starter um, with more than a month left in the season. Lucas Gordon moves up to number two and, and Tristan Stevens came through big time um, in the super regional yeah. when he got that game three start and kudos to him because he had struggled. He struggled in game one of the super regional so kudos to him for getting it back on the rails. But it was obvious this year when you looked at Texas leading the nation in fielding. Um, and look, Sean Allen's role changed when Troy Tulowitzki came onto the staff. Uh, Sean Allen was the hitting coach. Troy Tulowitzki came in uh, in 2020, took over the hitting coach, and the offense got better every year. Went from 257, batting average 275 to 314 this year. All the records broken including six different players with double digit home runs and, and Sean Allen's, you know, role became the pitching coach. Great job last year, this year, something was off. So David Pierce makes the tough call and um, that's the standard of excellence at Texas that we were just talking about when discussing the director's cup. And it's the standard of excellence that everybody uh, in Longhorn nation is hoping is, is uh, spreading over to the Texas football program. Um, Taylor, obviously a big weekend, recruiting weekend, huge recruiting weekend for Texas. Arch Manning, Arch Madness, the five-star uh, quarterback, son of Cooper Manning, nephew of Peyton and Eli Manning, and uh, the most sought-after quarterback in the 2023 recruiting class, comes to Texas for his official visit. And um, his tight end, Will Randall has committed to Texas, by the way. Um, I take think that for what it's worth. <laughs> take that for, take that <laughs> for what it's worth. Too much, Chip. Come on. <laughs> you know, Taylor, this feels like Texas is in a good spot with Arch Manning. Now, to me, it feels like the only thing that could, you know, hold it back is some unforeseen circumstance or some terrible season. Yeah. Um, you know, with this off season that Texas football has had, I think everyone's expecting improvement from five and seven for sure. I mean, yeah, you would hope so. My goodness. I mean, uh, you don't want to have two back to back five and seven seasons. We've seen what that does to a coach and that, and you're right. I think that, you know, um, if you did not catch the state of recruiting, the special episode of the state of recruiting this week, we did not do our interview episode because we wanted to give the guys a chance to um, immediately, you know, recap the official visit weekend. So if you did not listen to that, go back to Monday's episode of the state of recruiting. It's definitely worth the watch or listen, whether you're um, listening on the podcast or watching on the YouTube page. But, you know, I think that Texas is probably silent or quietly optimistic right now. Um, the one thing with 
the Arch Manning family, I mean, there's not really a timeline. And nobody they, they play everything so close to the chest that you're not really – I don't think anybody knows what the timeline is. There, there's thoughts that he wants to get this done prior to the season, but he's never officially come out and said that as like a hard, you know, I'm committing on this date and shutting everything down mm -hmm. type of situation. I think he's going to do it whenever he feels it's right. And I do think, Chip, that um, if you're a Texas – fan, you hope it doesn't go to the season. I would say that because just because of, you know, Texas week two plays at home against Alabama. Um, and I think they're a 15 point um, underdog at this point, you know, leading up, this is in June too. So, uh, and Alabama was a team that was in the mix with Arch Manning, not so much anymore um, since they did land the quarterback commit, but still, you know, uh, they're Georgia's still definitely in this one. And I just feel like I would I would be surprised with this chip if if Arch made a commitment prior to the season. I would I don't, couldn't imagine from everything that it sounds like the the type of person he is that he would flip or change it even if the season turned out poorly. Now if the season turns out 5 and 7 and people are talking about firing Steve Sarkeesian, we have a totally different situation on our hands, but you hope that's not the case. I I just think Texas is probably in a better situation if this decision comes down before the season starts. What about you? Yeah, I mean, I think the things that you're hearing that Mike Roach and and Hudson Standish at Horns 24-7 have been reporting uh, are that Arch Manning doesn't feel the need to come in and be the savior. In fact, he'd be willing to redshirt possibly or serve as a backup for a year uh, so that if, let's say, Quinn Ewers – uh, ends up, you know, climbing uh, in terms of progress, the way that his recruiting ranking, number one recruit in the country for 2021. Um, if if he's that good, then he would probably be a, a three and out player and Arch Manning would take over uh, in the 2024 season, which just might be when Texas is beginning play in the SEC. Yeah. But um yeah, and I, I asked this week on Horns247.com in, in my morning brew column um, what would be an acceptable season for, for Longhorn Nation because I've said eight wins and Arch Manning. Yeah. And and so, you know, obviously everyone in Longhorn Nation is hoping for more, nine wins, ten wins, a Big 12 championship, but acceptable. I think eight wins and Arch Manning, Taylor. Yeah, I agree. And and one thing when you are talking about Archie and you're saying, you know, that he may not be the guy that wants to come in and be the savior, or, you know, he's okay with potentially sitting behind somebody. This is someone from the Manning family. I mean, is there a more um, quarterback elite family in the country in history of all of football than the Mannings? I, I can't think of one personally. And so I think he has enough um, – guidance around him to and people who have obviously been there to know that starting early is not always the most um, conducive thing to your future success at a football program if you're a quarterback. I mean, quarterback and offensive line are the positions more times than not that you want to at least have a redshirt year or a year where you are not required to start. And so um, I would be shocked if uh, that that little lingo, that little message, that little nugget has not been put into Arch Manning's head because it's the Manning family. You have to think that they they know better than any of us, all of us combined, honestly, what it what um, is best for a quarterback. And and I think that most coaches will tell you the best thing for a college quarterback is to sit and learn for a year and learn the college games is totally diff different than high school, especially for a guy like Arch that's coming from a, you know, a smaller, not um, the big question about him has been like, what's the competition he faces, you know, um, at, at his door in Newman out in New Orleans. So I think, you know, this is, this is setting up, I think for a good situation for Texas, but I am <laughs> a little bit like, you know, cautious to say that just not knowing when this timeline is going to be, if it goes into the season and Texas, you know, loses a few games that this could change, I would say. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. It's um, looking good right now, coming off the official visit weekend for Arch Manning at Texas. Um, he and also who, wants kudos to Steve Sarkeesian and his staff to be this in with this. I mean, if if they're able to potentially land two back to back num nation number one overall prospect 
let alone number one overall quarterback prospect and like the elite of the elite, you know, the guys that have perfect rankings basically on 24 seven sports composite. The fact that he's in the mix and we're talking this way after a five and seven season is huge. So I don't want to discredit them either. Even if they yeah. don't land them, the fact that they made it this far, I think is, is something you don't want to count out. Yeah. And Steve Sarkeesian um, needs to capitalize on the momentum of his um, offensive prowess uh, that he put on display at Alabama when they won the national championship uh, in, in 2020. And if he can, like you said, reel in the top quarterbacks in, in the next two, well, two of the next three recruiting classes, then um, that's what it takes. And, and Arch Manning also probably wants to let the that stellar offensive line recruiting class grow up a little bit. Yeah, uh, so he's not ready for his life. <laughs> know that he's got some seasoned uh, offensive linemen in front of him. Yeah. Uh, because I think everyone agrees that the offensive line, we talked about this last week, and that'll lead us into our uh, summer series, um, you know, counting down the position rankings for Texas. We talked about the offensive line last week if you missed that episode make sure you check it out because i think everyone agrees that this this crop uh this top class of offensive linemen um, taken by texas in 2022 is going to be a lot better in 23 and 24 uh, than it will be this year so um, that sort of coincides with arch manning's timeline so um, i'm sure those those guys all spent a lot of time together this past weekend. Yes. Um, Taylor, let's get into our position ranking countdown. All righty. Last week, as we mentioned, at uh, we're counted down from 10 to 1. Last week, uh, the offensive line came in at 10. Special teams came in at 9, primarily because Cameron Dicker has moved on. There are some other bright spots on special teams, but, you know, kicking field goals when you need them really uh, – you know, in a tight spot is a huge priority for every college football team, every football team. But Taylor, we come in today at number eight and the position is safety, safety. And this is an interesting situation. It's not ideal by any standard. We talked to Michael Griffin, the three-time pro bowler and safety on the Texas 2005 national championship team. And he said, it's crazy to me that we're talking about moving players from other positions to fill out the safety too deep at Texas, but that's indeed what is happening. There's been a mass exodus at safety uh, in the transfer portal um, from Xavier Alford to USC, Tyler Owens to TCU, uh, Chris Adamora has, uh, you know, he's, he's gone and, the list goes on. BJ Foster, for crying out loud, um, what? No matter what you think of him, he's finishing his career um, at Sam Houston State. So right. um, you've got now you've got Anthony Cook, who's moved from nickel to safety. You've got um, you know Keaton Crawford, who's moved from corner to safety, and you've got Mo Blackwell, one of my favorite young up and coming players, who's moved from linebacker to safety in part because. He wasn't putting on weight as quickly as they thought he would. He's still right around 215. And, of course, you still have Jaron Thompson, who started five games last year at safety. So you've got guys who've been on the field. They just haven't been on the field at safety. And that's a lot to consume, digest, spring football, fall camp, and then expect to go out there and and be the – the quarterbacks, the the nerve center of the secondary. Yeah, and these are also guys that have never been on the field at safety together either. I mean, aside from spring practice, that's but it's, it's spring practice. So we had to take that for what it's worth. And, you know, Chip and I, when we were doing these position rankings, when we were laying them out um, prior to last week's show, we were kind of like on the fence with if this should be, you know, the number eight one, just because it seems like there's a lot of potential but it's kind of similar. I, I wouldn't say it's similar to special teams at all. This is definitely different. But the unknown does like is similar in this way. The other thing for me, Chip, was it's too hard for me to shake the safety play from last year. Like, I mean, I, I may have put safety at nine, honestly, if if 
Um, it wasn't for special teams having, you know, a new kicker and punter this season. So um, this was basically a, a coin flip for me, to be honest, just, just for the sheer fact of what we saw last year and how at times egregious it really was. And so these guys, they, you know, you hope there's, these are guys that have at least seen the field. They have experience. They know, you know, secondary play. However, are they going to be the guys that can line up the people in front of them that can help, you know, call out what the plays are, do every, be the quarterback of the defense. That's a, that's a tall task to ask of any first time player at a position. And there's going to be several guys that are going to be called upon to do that, who, um, you know, haven't, haven't done it either at the position or a Jaron Thompson who struggled, you know, got benched last year and had, some of the more regrettable um, mistakes on plays that were huge plays that are hard to shake. And so this is, you know, Blake Gideon is, uh, he's he's got to show what he can bring here. I, I really think just because after last year, and I, I don't think last year was necessarily his fault per se, just because, I mean, he was relying on a safety that moved from receiver and had not played safeties for, since he was a freshman in college. So it's a little, you know, it's hard to, you know, totally blame him, but there was a lot of hype and potential for Jaron Thompson. It seemed like he did regress last year. You got to, if you're Blake getting, you got to hope that that really like something switches in his head or these other guys, you know, really um, come on fast because it could make him look like, um, you know, kind of uh, the genius or the joker in this, in this um, situation. So yeah, this is a lot of questions at safety. And I think it's kind of similar with the, you know, with the special teams. There's just not as much hope on my end of the the potential for the position this year. Yeah, and Anthony Cook is a ball hawk. He, yeah, you know, the the word out of spring was that he had like five interceptions in the spring, and then he had one in the spring game, and that his skills and typically, typically when a corner like in the nfl michael griffin talked about this when a corner's skills start to diminish he gets moved to safety where he can see the whole field it's like he's playing um zone coverage all the time and if he's you know got great football iq and has done his film study he knows what keys to watch to be able to adjust as the as the play unfolds and communicate that. And the, the, the thing that's a little unnerving is that Anthony cook is kind of a quiet guy. Now, from what we've heard, uh, he's been vocal and he's been on point. Uh, but you know, Jade Baron, who's, who's playing nickel, uh, replacing Anthony cook after moving from corner, probably the more vocal, uh, of, player in that secondary. So, you know, there are, there are just some nagging things. And like you said, Brendan Schooler, who played safety as a freshman at Oregon, then made the move to receiver, then made the move back to safety last year. It was up and down, very choppy and not, not Brendan Schooler's fault. It was a collective effort, but you're right. There were some real issues in some big games, some big plays, where games went from in Texas's favor to Texas losing the game that uh, involved breakdowns at the safety position. Now there were breakdowns in front of them too. I'm not saying that Um, gaps were not uh, maintained and when gaps aren't maintained and the ball's not coming through the gap that everyone expects, then everything gets, turns into a fire drill. Right. So that all of that uh, has to get better. And, you know, obviously, Blake Gideon and Terry Joseph. Terry Joseph is kind of the secondary coach, but coaches the corners. Uh, Blake Gideon's the safeties coach. They all have to be in unison too. Yeah. Um, and they have to be in unison with Pete Kwiatkowski, the defensive coordinator. If if everybody's not on the same page, then the front and the back of the defense are not tied together and it turns into a mess. So Steve Sarkeesian's had all year to digest what happened last year to make the adjustments. And uh, so I'm expecting a much better situation, even though you've got newcomers um, coming from other positions, holding down safety this season. Yeah. And when you talk about the coaches being on the same page, especially, you know, court 
I always want to call him Corey Joseph, <laughs> Terry Joseph, not the basketball player from Texas, Terry Joseph and Blake Gideon. Um, you know, I, I talked to a former Texas player that played under Mac Brown in kind of the glory years of Texas football. And uh, this former player had been to several practices. And one thing that he asked me was who who's in charge of the secondary? And I was like, well, you know, Blake Gideon's safeties coach, um, Terry Joseph is corners coach. And he said to me, and this is something that was very interesting that I really hadn't thought about before. He said, in his opinion, was there needs to be one secondary coach because the message needs to come from one guy and everybody needs to hear it. And he said, when Texas was DBU, Dwayne Aquina had corners and safeties meet together. They did everything together. Corners and safeties would go over to Dwayne Aquina's house even just for dinner, like randomly in the middle of the week. And it was that type of bond and that type of familiarity with one another that this former player believes is the reason that turned Texas into DBU. So when he said that, I was kind of like, well, there's two coaches. So where's this coming from? And I'm, I'm you know, when um, the one thing that threw him off guard was when there's a play that broke up, he's like, yeah, I saw two guys go to two different players and they're telling each other totally different messages. And it was the two secondary coaches. So, you know, being on page with not just like one another in the secondary, but the players being on page together too, is something that clearly a former player at Texas that played when Texas was DBU noticed right away when he was at, at um, spring practice. And that's something that you hope changes. If you're telling players on the field to pass the message along, you want to make sure that the players they're passing along to understand what the message is. And so that's something you, you would hope kind of gets cleaned up this season. Yeah, for sure. No doubt. Because I thought there were, I, it looked at times like, when the offense was adjusting, Texas was having trouble communicating their adjustments to the offense's adjustments. And that communication for a first time staff can happen, but it's got to get cleaned up. It's got to get better. There should be improvement as the season goes on. And I'm not sure that we saw that kind of improvement last year. Definitely need to see it this year. Yeah. All right, let's get to number seven in our position ranking countdown and that is corner cornerback co coinciding with each other today coinciding we yeah. kind of covered a lot of the same ground just now uh taylor but you lose josh thompson um who was one of two players texas longhorn players invited to the combine he and cameron dicker uh, josh thompson solid leader and had a pick six uh, in that route of Texas Tech, made some other big plays, breaking up passes in the end zone, was a plus player for the Texas defense last year. He's gone, and you've got Deshaun Jameson back as a fifth-year senior, and you've brought in Ryan Watts, the six-foot-three uh, corner from Ohio State, who's got experience and immediately uh, took over at boundary corner for Texas throughout the whole spring, never, never wavered. Um, you know, Deshaun Jameson was getting challenged by Jalen Gilbo in the spring. Then Jalen Gilbo got suspended. Uh, Steve Patterson, I mean, uh, Steve Patterson, um, Steve Sarkeesian has said, <laughs> Sarkeesian that, can blackball you for that. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, Steve Sarkeesian has said that Jalen Gilbo and Ishmael Ibrahim, uh, both cornerbacks, both talented, but both suspended for violating team rules. Uh, he expects them back for fall camp. And so uh, that figures into the equation as well, but we don't know when they'll be back. Uh, and Michael Griffin said point blank, Ryan Watts is a safety. Uh, now they may put him at boundary corner, uh, but I watched him in the spring game. That dude's a safety. So um, it's, there's some questions. There's some questions there. Now you've got good young players mentioned Jalen Gilbo. You've also got Terrence Brooks who has been working behind Ryan Watts at that, um, boundary corner position. And, and so we'll see, you've got some, an interesting mix of veterans and young players. Uh, but 
the the goal, Steve Sarkeesian said, uh, change in philosophy is to play more man, press man, so that they can free up a safety to come into the box and help stop the run. Because last year they couldn't even stop the run. So uh, there's going to be a, a higher expectation for these corners to be able to get up on some of these receivers and get them off their route, be physical, uh, and allow more time for the pass rush to get there and uh, in in certain situations for an extra hat in the box to help stop the run. Well, and one thing with that, the flip side of that, though, Chip, is you are leaving these guys kind of out on an island at times with one-on-one coverage, you know, and that's um, without the safety help. That could be – that could work great if these guys perform, you know, up to expectations. But if they don't, that could be – um, you know, it's kind of the double-edged sword a little bit there. So yeah, there, there's a lot of question here. Um, I think the little bit of a regression of Deshaun Jamison last year made this position kind of be at number seven. I'm, I won't tease what, you know, next week's position rankings are, but this was one where I, I had this, I think I had it at six. And then the more we talked about, I was like, nah, seven's good because there is a lot of the, you know, changes there. Um, rely on Ryan Watts, uh, obviously coming from Ohio State, been in the collegiate program, still though a pretty like um, green player at the college level, I would say. And then, um, you know, the fact alone that Jalen Gilbo was really gunning for Deshaun Jamison's job in spring football when he'd only been on campus for um, three months. I mean, him getting suspen- suspended, I know you and I had talked about this behind the scenes before, but him getting suspensive, suspended should have been a huge wake up call for Deshaun Jamison because he kind of got to get out of jail free card, honestly, with that. I mean, as bad as it sounds, that's the, that's the truth because he's a fifth year guy or yeah, he's a fifth year guy. Yeah. Fifth year. And the fact that he potentially was fighting for his job with the guy that had just, you know, joined the college program only after a few months, that's not the best sign. So you hope that something clicks with Deshaun Jamison. He kind of reverts back to the, playmaker that he has shown flashes that he can be because when he's on he's really good but last year he was off a lot and teams started picking on him a lot and that's where I think you know I've said before on the flagship podcast but I feel like Josh Thompson probably never got a lot of the credit that he was deserved like owed because they were picking on Deshaun Jameson so bad it just looked the entire made the entire and the safeties were so bad it made the entire secondary look terrible honestly last year even though Josh Thompson was really oftentimes a lockdown corner. Um, you know, there was, there was a point last season where he was like the number one uh, player in the country, according to pro football focus of the amount of times that like he was targeted and um, for touchdowns that he was able to like break up or so, it was something like that. So it was a mid season accolade too. So obviously I think his, his play kind of got overlooked because of the, the issues around him and Deshaun Jameson has to step it up for sure. Cause if Jalen Gilbo is coming back and you have a true freshman that is toe to toe with a veteran more times than not coaches will go with the younger guy, especially yeah. at a position like corner. Yeah. And the, 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 the sort of steady habit, bad habit of Deshaun Jameson is, you know, he'll jump a route. You can double move him and you give him the pump fake on the, you know, the, the shorter route he'll bite. And then, boom, the receiver gets up on top of him and it's a big play. And Deshaun Jameson got a little lazy last year with in those situations and had his eyes in the wrong place. And he's got to get back to being more disciplined uh, because we all remember uh, the big plays that he's made, and including that layout interception at West Virginia. That's one uh, of the couple, interceptions I've seen. Couple, it. Yeah, it yeah. was like the um, – you know, OBJ layout catch when he was with the Giants against the Cowboys. So we know Deshaun James and Deshaun was a physical player. He'd come up and he'd he'd get after the run. It just seemed like he lost some of that edge. He needs to get it back. And if he does, then the Texas cornerback position will be better off for it because, you know, Jalen Gilbo, Ryan Watts, um, even um, – you know, we'll see, but Ishmael Ibrahim, if, if these guys can all, um, you know, add their big long corners, which is what you want, they can continue to develop. 
that's going to be a, a position of strength right now. It's a position of question. All right, Taylor, let's, uh, let's get to some love it or leave it. All right. Before we get to love it or leave it, we'll take a very quick break, but stick around because we have more football talk and baseball talk coming up in love it or leave it. So stay tuned. We will be right back. And if you're watching us on the Horns 24-7 YouTube channel, we'll just continue on here. So, Chip, let's uh, bring in some love it or leave it. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. First one is love it or leave it. Your leading candidate to be the team's defensive MVP this season is De DeMarvian Overshawn. I almost just said Deshaun Jameson, <laughs> even though I'm reading it, obviously. Well, I mean, on paper, yes. I'm going to I'm going to love this because DeMarvian Overshawn is as dynamic as it gets and you know he's a long, rangy, fast linebacker who honestly it seemed made more plays uh, in his first year at linebacker under Chris Ash than he did last year under Pete Kwiatkowski. Now he was the leading tackler on the team. He blocked a punt against Oklahoma and he has the ability to take over games. Like he has the physical ability to take over games, but I didn't think he played as physical last year as he needed to. And part of that was because, you know, coming off COVID, he was one of the last guys to report. He didn't have a, a good off season uh, going into that uh, 2020 season uh, in the weight room. And then he had a shoulder injury leading into the 2021 um, you know, summer. So he didn't have a great, you know, year in the weight room again. Now he has, I expect DeMarvin Overshawn, uh, who's a charismatic leader and a guy, I think his teammates look up to, um, you know, he needs to just buckle down, get to work and show everybody what he's all about. Um, because he's capable and I, I'm going to love this. I would love to be wrong, like someone else, like just becoming a dominant pass rusher, a sack artist, but I don't know who that guy is at this point. So I'm going to love this, Taylor. How about you? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the safe bet, you know, in, in June, as we talk about the upcoming season and talk about an MVP, which is a postseason accolade that you would give to somebody. I think, yeah, this, this is, I think it's easy to love this because it's, probably the safest bet. Um, but I agree with you. I think you you probably want to see something else because this is, De, you know, DeMarvian Overshaw. I keep wanting to say Deshaun Jameson. My goodness, it's even right in front of my freaking face. Sorry about that. DeMarvian Overshaw, you know, this is going to be his last hurrah at Texas. And so you would love to see a guy that has more playing, you know, time um, on or availability, I guess, for the future to really step up and become that defensive MVP the guy I, I think I personally, if I were, you know, want, if I was a Texas fan really wanting to see somebody come on, I would probably pick Byron Murphy, to be honest. I, I think I would probably want him to be the defensive MVP. I think he showed so many flashes last season as a, you know, a true freshman. He was a Big 12 true freshman um, of the year nominee for uh, a runner up. I think it was. I forget exactly what the correct title is for that, but honorable mention. My bad. He was a you know freshman of the year honorable mention in the conference. I think he has a lot of upside. And so if I were saying who at the end of the season, if I were a Texas fan, who would I want it to be? I would probably say Byron Murphy. But who I think it is a safe bet right now is definitely DeMarvey and Overshawn. So I'm going to agree with you and love it too. Yeah, if it was Byron Murphy, it would mean that he was showing you Casey Hampton type stuff. <laughs> and that, I agree with you, would be outstanding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Bo Davis can probably get it out of him. It's just there's there's a lot more, you know, pieces to the puzzle than just one guy. So Yeah. All right. Love it or leave it number two. Number two, love it or leave it. Texas baseball met its gold standard of reaching Omaha, but the two and barbecue finish made the season feel like a disappointment. Uh, you know, I hate to I hate to say that I love this because so many good things happened. So I'm not going to say, I mean, the finish was certainly a disappointment, but I'm not going to say the season I'll leave this um, because 
you lead the nation in fielding percentage. Um, you're, you're, you know, you bat 314 as a team. Six different players have double digit home runs. That's never been done before. You set the school record. You obliterate the school record for home runs um, by by more than 40, uh, 128 home runs at Dish. You know, a lot of those at Dish Falk Field, which is a cavernous uh, field, hard to hit home runs, especially over the Green Monster or the yeah the outfield monster, the monster. <laughs> And Ivan Melendez, I mean, Ivan Melendez, National Player of the Year. And, uh, you know, Hauser, trophy winner, probably going to win the Golden Spikes Award. Um, Look, it wasn't the Omaha that Texas wanted. Uh, The finish was disappointing, but I'm not going to say the season was disappointing because there were a lot of really cool things that happened. In some ways, I'm astounded that Texas got to Omaha with the erratic nature of the pitching. Um, I'm kind of surprised they took two in a row from Oklahoma state, um, in the big 12 tournament and, and then got beat up by Oklahoma who's still uh, doing well in Omaha. Uh, but man, you lead the nation in fielding percentage and all the good things that happened at the plate this year for Texas. I'm not going to say the whole season was a disappointment because, um, you know, too many other good things happened. So I'm going to leave this, Taylor. How about you? Yeah, I agree. I'm going to leave it too, because while the finish absolutely was a disappointment, there's no denying that. Um, I, you know, there was a a thread on Horns 24-7 after the loss to Texas A&M to be eliminated from the College World Series where people were kind of uh, questioning, you know, where, where does Texas baseball go from here type of thing. And I made this comment. I was like, I think people really underestimate how big of a loss it is when you lose a start a weekend starter at the college baseball level. I mean, it's, it's can be detrimental. And this I think was the absolute worst thing that could have happened to Texas. Cause as you know, we were talking earlier in the show, I, I feel like the loss of Tanner Witt really kind of caused a ton of splintering and fracturing in the entire, you know, um, pitching roster to be honest and in the bullpen. And so um, I think you can't, you know, I think you can't underestimate that type of thing. But again, when, when we're talking about this team, I was kind of surprised they made it to Omaha too, especially after the super regional. I mean, they were what one inning away from being eliminated from the super regional and then they, they came back and it was their bats. But I said this last week on the show, Chip with Texas baseball this season, with the way that in the erratic um, um, level of pitching that you had seen from um, across the board, honestly, uh, even if Texas had a cushion lead, you never really felt like warm and fuzzy inside because you just never know what was going to happen. you always trusted the bats, but you know, when it had to, you know, rely on the defense from the mound, that was something that you, you were always worried about. And so I, I think it's, it's an accomplishment. They made it to the college world series. It's a disappointment that they, you know, um, are gone after two games and we're what the first team eliminated, I believe from there. But the other thing too is, I mean, Texas baseball, when you talk about Ivan Melendez winning the Hauser Trophy, I mean, that's like the Heisman Trophy of college baseball. That's what a lot of people call it. So they essentially had a college baseball, you know, version of a Heisman winner on their roster. His season was amazing. I mean, he didn't have the best outing in Omaha. I know that, but still, you know, breaking the the home run record, single season home run record that was previously set by Chris Bryant in 2013. I mean, there, there's so many positives that you can take away from this team. So I agree. Excuse me. I'm going to, uh, I agree. I'm going to leave it too and say finish disappointment season, not a disappointment. All right. Love it or leave it. Number three. All right. My final one for you is love it or leave it. The only way Texas doesn't end up signing 2023 five-star quarterback Arch Manning is by not showing forward progress this season. You know, Based on everything I'm hearing right now, I'm going to I'm going to love this. I think Arch Manning wants to come to Texas. I think he likes the idea of uh, helping to restore a, a football giant where you know, he sees how Vince Young and Colt McCoy uh, are revered uh, and held up in to, to a fan base with so many living alumni 
and I think that it excites him. I think it's different from what his uh, uncles did, although Texas is joining the SEC, so he's probably (laughs) going to end up having it be the same. Not the historical Um, SEC, though. (laughs) Yeah, kind of an interesting little um, quirk there. But I I do feel like they have really – Gone. I mean, I know they've gone all in on Arch Manning and Steve Sarkeesian's approach has been very, very uh, acceptable uh, to Arch Manning, obviously. So I do feel like the only way they don't sign him is if they don't show the kind of progress we're all expecting after the kind of offseason that Texas has had uh, with the with the recruiting class, the the assistant coaches that were hired, Gary Patterson coming in uh, and Steve Sarkeesian saying where he failed was at this time last year, not building a better connection within his team when they were displaced from uh, their, their new home in the South end, uh, which was still under construction uh, or the renovation was still being completed. And so, you know, I think Steve Sarkeesian has learned from his mistakes and I think he is seen as a quarterback guru, obviously with the players, I mean, who else can say that they were the quarterback's coach at a school where a kid who barely played, never started a game, um, Matt Castle, ends up, you know, going on to become a Pro Bowl quarterback in the NFL. Yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to love this, Taylor. How about you? Yeah, I'm going to love it, too. And it kind of goes back, you know, if if Arch Manning pushes his decision to the season, um, I feel like I would not be as confident in Texas chances just because I, I think it's fair to say that Texas is going to start off one and one, right? I mean, it, I mean, unless I beat Alabama, I will happily eat crow because I know our members over at Horns 24-7 will be ecstatic and we will not have to be dealing with the, the sky is falling type of post game on our message board after a, like an embarrassing loss or something like that. Um, but, you know, I, I think that I agree. I think um, if there's struggles that are, you know, even reminiscent of potentially a five and seven season, then no way that Texas gets Arch Manning because you know what the, the headlines are going to be and the, the calls for people's job are going to be at an all time high. We, you can't have back to back losing seasons at Texas. We've seen it happen to a coach that, I mean, he had back to back to back losing seasons, I guess. So that was worse. But still, yeah, I think. I think that um, the that at this point, if Texas has even, a, even an eight win season or something like that, that some people may not think is great, but still it's, it's improvement, then I think that Texas lands Arch Manning. If they have a you know 500 season or worse, then yeah, I think that that's probably the one thing that would make it where Texas does not sign him, just because I think of the you know the the cries and the calls for Steve Sarkeesian's job that will certainly follow if that were going to play out in 2022 after that five and seven season last year. There you go. There you go. All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks for uh, checking in with us here on the flagship podcast. Um, Good stuff. We will continue our, our, uh, our position ranking countdown next week. We will be on to uh, number six and number five. Uh, So thanks, everybody. Until next time, we'll see you over at horns247.com. For Taylor Estes, I'm Chip Brown. Stay safe and keep the faith.